Thanks very much for joining us and um, welcome to WOW's Light for 2020. We're very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Ken Lee from London, Ontario, to talk about buprenorphine induction strategies. Sometimes one of the strategies he will describe is called the Bernese method. My name's Jeremy Haylar and I'm from Queensland Health uh, in Brisbane. Um, this evening's mm. session is being recorded, so later on in the week or in coming days, it'll be available on the Insight website. So thank you to Ben and Jeff for making that happen. Um, we're very pleased to welcome Dr. Ken Lee. He started out training in general medicine and working in inner city world, he came into contact with substance use issues and that led to his ongoing interest in this field. So with no more ado, um, other than to say, if there are any questions as we're going along, we thought we'd try and leave them till the end. Um, there is a chat function on Zoom. So if you want to make a question uh, through that means, then please feel free and we'll try and deal with them uh, towards the end of the session. We're planning to run for about an hour, but that's flexible. And Dr. Lee said he would talk for about half an hour. So leaving plenty of time for questions. So I'll hand over to Dr. Lee and once again, thank him very warmly. He's got up very early this morning to be with us. So the wonders of technology. Thank you, Ken. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, for that kind introduction and that warm introduction because it is actually freezing here in Canada right now. And we're expecting about 20, 30 centimeters of snow. So. Um, it's going to be an interesting day coming up. Um, as Jeremy indicated, um, I've been doing addiction medicine for a long time. Um, started back in 1998 uh, in the uh, old days of methadone, <clears throat> when that was all that was available. And then about uh, 12 years ago, through a special access program, uh, uh, we got access to a buprenorphine known as Suboxone in Canada, which is the uh, combination product of buprenorphine and naloxone. Where I work now, is what's called a RAM clinic. It's a, <clears throat> the concept, it's, it's a rapid access addiction medicine clinic. Um, it is open uh, only three uh, half days a week. <clears throat> and the idea is to see patients quickly, transition them to um, <clears throat> opiate agonist therapy, which we do a lot of, um, but we also treat uh, alcohol use disorders and, and we try what we can do for <clears throat> crystal meth, uh, ice, as you know it in Australia, and uh, cocaine. And so keeping that in mind, uh, our, our clinic is only open three half days a week. We, we have to modify our buprenorphine induction strategies so, so that uh, follow-up can occur on a day that the clinic is actually open. And so here's the uh, <clears throat> general concept. We are the uh, green box at the bottom there, the rapid access uh, addiction medicine clinic, RAM clinic as we call it. We aim to see people within seven days and we try to repatriate patients uh, back to their primary care provider if, if that's possible. Uh, we've been doing this since uh, 2014. Um, also referrals by the patients directly from withdrawal management or from the emergency department. Um, I'm going to go over a number of uh, induction strategies. And uh, these are some of the topics that I'll cover. The standard induction, which is all we had uh, back in the early days when you followed the product monograph of uh, Suboxone, where you were giving uh, four milligrams of Suboxone to a patient that uh, was in significant withdrawal, and then you could follow that up with another four milligrams. But that's all we had back then. And, and many patients were never able to present in enough withdrawal for us to uh, do a proper induction. So that's, that's what we call the standard induction. And then uh, a couple years ago, I learned about the microdose induction, the uh, Bernese method. And uh, that segued into um, doing methadone conversions from suboxone to methadone using the microdose induction method. I'll touch on some special cases, um, street fentanyl. I'm not sure if that's a problem in Australia or do you see more of a problem with heroin? Um, some nuances with uh, conversions from fentanyl patches, uh, butrans, which is the transdermal buprenorphine patch that we have. It's a very, very low dose in Canada. I'm not sure if you have that in Australia. And now what we're doing more is um, basic, uh, simple, very simple home inductions where patients take doses of uh, suboxone home and uh, with instructions on how to start 
do their own induction. So <clears throat> I'm going to go through uh, a number of case situations to illustrate this. And the patients are essentially the same, except they present in different degrees of withdrawal or not in withdrawal and, and different substances. So let's say we have this 35-year-old male using hydromorphone by injection several times a day, last used about 12 hours ago. The COWS score, the clinical opiate withdrawal scale, is 18. So the, a moderate amount of withdrawal, moderate to, to severe withdrawal, and distinctly uncomfortable. And this is a patient that, um, that we initially would typically see and ask patients to present in this degree of withdrawal for us to do a standard buprenorphine induction. And so this is the uh, standard induction that we do. We give people two milligrams of buprenorphine to start. Um, if they're very, very uncomfortable, we can go with four milligrams or speed up the intervals. And then we give basically two milligrams every hour until you get to 12 milligrams um, on day one. And then day two, they come back to see us and uh, we titrate up to uh, comfort, often 16 milligrams or possibly higher. So that's your uh, standard induction that we were doing for years. This was the patient you would have trouble with uh, in, in the past. The same patient, the 35-year-old male using hydromorphone by injections, used just before clinic because he needed to do that so that he can get to the clinic. And you do his cow score, and it's only two, which basically no withdrawal. So uh, years ago, we would tell this patient, well, you need to go home. You need to not use for about 12 hours and then come back, and, and then we will uh, try to do the induction again. So more than half of the patients would not show up the next day because they just couldn't accomplish this. Um, so this was not good. Um, and then I came across uh, the following paper um, by Dr. Robert Hemig, um, described the Bernese method. And it was an interesting paper. It was uh, case, uh, um, case uh, reviews of uh, three patients, uh, mainly heroin using patients. Um, where he used small doses of uh, buprenorphine while the patient continued to use their uh, heroin and was able to do an induction um, onto uh, buprenorphine. And the beauty of this was the patient was not in any uh, withdrawal. And the basic premise is that tiny, small doses of buprenorphine do not precipitate withdrawal. And uh, this was done very slowly uh, with very, very small dose increases of, of, of like 0.5 milligrams daily over two weeks. And with uh, time we've learned now you don't have to have, uh, you don't have to do it quite so slowly and you will really only need about 12 hours between um, suboxone dose increases. So we've shortened the induction period to, uh, to about one week. So I went to go visit uh, Dr. Hamig in Bern, Switzerland, um, on our road trip uh, last summer, and uh, spent a day with him in his clinic. Um, and it's interesting, in Switzerland, they don't use a lot of buprenorphine. They mostly use uh, methadone, and they have access to the L-isomer, the active uh, isomer of methadone, um, hydromorphone, um, cadian, um, slow-release oral morphine, 24-hour slow release, and, and heroin. So actually, um, he didn't use a lot of uh, buprenorphine in Switzerland, um, which was interesting. The other, uh, the other uh, researcher um, who was important to this uh, was Dr. Mark Greenwald. And he's a uh, PhD researcher in uh, opiate receptor uh, occupancy in opiates and, and opiate treatment at Wayne State University, which is about two hours away from London, Canada here in Detroit, Michigan. And basically this was a, a study of a uh, pharmacokinetic study of 10 patients using a buprenorphine 16 milligrams versus hydromorphone IV um, in, in volunteers who were uh, drug users, um, six, 12, 24 milligrams of hydromorphone. And just to summarize um, his findings was that when you had 50% mu receptor occupancy, which was uh, equivalent to about one nanogram per ml of buprenorphine, um, withdrawal symptoms were, were uh, mitigated and, and treated. Cravings uh, did not go away until there was about 80% mu receptor occupancy, which was a plasma level of two nanograms per ml. So 
To get 50% receptor occupancy, you need between two and four milligrams of buprenorphine to achieve that. Um, and the reason that you need two milligrams uh, will occupy uh, somewhere between 27 and 50% of the receptors is very variable at the lower doses of buprenorphine. Um, so you really don't see mitigation of uh, withdrawal symptoms uh, until you get to about four milligrams of buprenorphine. And interestingly, uh, as he increased the dose of buprenorphine, 16 milligrams was able to block out the effect of the IV hydromorphone. These are uh, two uh, curves that he generated from his data. On the left graph there is a single buprenorphine dose, the plasma level of uh, buprenorphine with one single dose of buprenorphine. Um, the Cmax, uh, the highest concentration, plasma concentration you get is 3.9 nanograms per ml, um, which occurs at the Tmax of 2.2 hours. The right graph is a graph uh, with the x-axis showing mu receptor availability, which is the inverse of mu receptor occupancy. And then the y-axis is the, is the plasma concentration of buprenorphine. And there's the uh, relationship between plasma concentration and mu receptor um, availability. And it's hard to see with the scale, but your two nanograms per ml um, graphs out to about um, 20 to 30% um, mu receptor availability, which on the inverse is 70 to 80% mu receptor occupancy. So we weren't the first people to try the Bernese method in Canada. It was first tried um, in Vancouver, and this was from uh, uh, Vancouver Coastal Health. Um, the theoretical background, uh, as I indicated, is repetitive small doses of buprenorphine, small, small doses, and sufficient dosing intervals. Um, initially, it was 12 hours, uh, 20 to 24 hours, and now we've cut that down to about 12 hours. And because of the long receptor binding time, buprenorphine will slowly accumulate at the receptor, um, this place holding more of the opiate receptors um, and not allowing the mu receptor, the full mu agonist to uh, access to the mu receptors. And so therefore you have more and more buprenorphine accumulating at the receptor and less and less of the full agonist. And, and that's the idea behind the, uh, the microdosing uh, method. So we, we uh, adapted all this, um, looking at all that, and have, have developed our own protocol. And I'm happy to share this. I can't remember if I did share this with Germany, but um, this is uh, our document. Uh, this version is the May 2019 document. We have updated versions now, and I'm happy to share that uh, with you. Um, so that's the background of the, uh, how we came to trying the uh, microdosing uh, suboxone inductions. So here, here's how we do it now. So here's this 35 year old uh, man who's using the hydromorphone. He used just before clinic. This is the patient who has the cows of 12, which um, is no withdrawal at all, essentially. And, and before microdosing, we would have turned this patient away and, try and come back the next day. So here's the schedule. This is our uh, BID seven day schedule, uh, microdose induction. Small doses in Canada, um, suboxone only comes in two milligram tablets, so uh, 0.5 milligrams BID is a quarter tablet BID. Uh, we asked the uh, pharmacist to cut these pills and blister pack them um, for the patient uh, either to take home or to take the first dose in the pharmacy and uh, the second dose at home, depending on the circumstances. So, so there's the schedule over seven days. The steps are small at the beginning and they get bigger as, as you get toward the end of the week. So 0.5 BID to 1 BID, 2, 3, 4, 5 to 6, etc. So after you get to buprenorphine 4 milligrams, suboxone 4 milligrams, because uh, of, of the, uh, the receptor occupancy, at 50% or more after you reach suboxone four milligrams, you can start decreasing the other opiate. You can choose to decrease the other opiate or not decrease the other opiate if the, uh, if the patient can't do that. Um, psychologically, it's sometimes easier um, to show that you're reducing the, uh, the fentanyl, hydromorph, uh, heroin or whatever, 
but you don't have to. You can just keep going up with your uh, Suboxone up to 12 milligrams a day. And then at 12 milligrams a day, for sure, you can stop all the other uh, outside opiates. And then at that point in time, you see the patient in follow-up. So this is after the six milligram BID day, after day seven, you see the patient on day eight, which is one week later. Um, patient starts at 12 milligrams and then you can titrate up to whatever dose um, the patient is comfortable, gets comfortable, whether sometimes it's 12, um, 16, sometimes it's 20 milligrams. It's uh, the receptor studies uh, will show, will um, indicate that 16 milligrams gives you two nanograms per ml going up to uh, 24 milligrams. Um, gives you a slightly higher plasma concentration, but the curve flattens, right? So that you don't get much more uh, receptor, mu receptor occupancy or blockade at 24 milligrams versus 16 milligrams. There is some more blockade, but not a whole lot. And uh, Greenwald study showed that when you get to 32 milligrams of buprenorphine, you essentially get um, 100% uh, mu receptor blockade. So, Initially, we didn't do methadone conversions because the, uh, the general teaching uh, was that you, it was almost impossible to convert people from methadone to Suboxone unless you were able to drop the methadone dose down to uh, 30 milligrams a day. But you can overcome that when you use the uh, microdose um, conversion method. And so let's say here's your same patient, the 35 year old uh, male who's on 70 milligrams of methadone He's asking to switch to buprenorphine. He's a no withdrawal. He's very comfortable on methadone. You explore why he wants to switch to uh, buprenorphine, and you find for various reasons. Um, the most common reason is that people feel a little bit of uh, sedation or mental clouding on methadone um, compared to being on uh, buprenorphine. So they people talk to friends and, and they they want to make the switch. And so here's here's how we would do it in, in this patient. We do the microdose schedule, the 0.5 BID, 1 BID, 2 BID, 3 BID. Um, after a whole day of buprenorphine, four milligrams, you can start decreasing the method by 10 milligrams a day. Uh, or you don't have to. You can, uh, you can continue the, the methadone at the same dose and then not stop the methadone at, uh, when you reach buprenorphine, 12 milligrams, either way. Um, is fine. It's sometimes easier if the patients uh, do decrease by 10 milligrams a day, because at 12 milligrams, it's it's a lot to ask someone to stop their uh, their methadone cold turkey. Um, it is psychologically uh, sometimes difficult to do that. And after you reach buprenorphine 12 milligrams, you simply just titrate up to comfort, and all the other, all the methadone can be stopped. So here's uh, this is an actual patient uh, that we did this on. This is a, a real patient. Um, so here's the uh, the schedule. It took nine days to make this conversion, eight or nine days. Um, so there it is on day 1.5 milligrams BID of buprenorphine. Methadone stays the same at 70. Day two, buprenorphine goes up. Um, methadone stays at the same. Day three, two milligrams BID, which means on day three, the patient will have received four milligrams of buprenorphine. And that day, they also got their 70 milligrams of methadone. Day four, um, knowing that on the previous day, the patient has had four milligrams of buprenorphine in their system. You continue going up on your buprenorphine, but the methadone can start uh, decreasing um, by 10 milligrams a day. You can uh, decrease uh, faster than that if, you, if the patient can tolerate it, but um, we usually just use um, 10 milligrams a day to, uh, as a taper. Some patients won't do that and say, well, I can only go down five. And they say, that's fine because we're gonna stop everything at 12 anyways at 12 milligrams of buprenorphine. So there you go, day five, you're going up. So buprenorphine's going up, methadone's going down. Um, and there you are on day seven, six milligrams BID. Methadone is down to 30 milligrams. So the following day, um, the patient takes 12 milligrams of uh, buprenorphine all at once. You don't have to do the uh, BID uh, the dosing anymore. The methadone can be stopped all that day. And then on that day eight, you can start titrating your buprenorphine up. Um, this patient got up to 16 milligrams um, and was comfortable uh, and follow up in one week. Um, if this patient decided to go on to uh, supplicate or in Australia, you can have, you can have Buvidol as well. Um, I don't make the conversion to a long acting injectable until the methadone metabolites are gone. 
out of their system. And I'm not sure if I have to do that, but that's uh, what I've been doing. So it takes about uh, 21 days after the last day of last dose of methadone before the uh, methadone metabolites are, are gone from the system. And as I mentioned, uh, that's my personal practice is to wait. I've not tried it um, earlier than that. So I do wait, it's about three weeks uh, after making the methadone to suboxone conversion before I would consider sublocate. Um, and then you go, you use your sublocate in the usual fashion, loading doses of 300 milligrams, 28 days apart, followed by a maintenance doses of 100 milligrams um, every 28 days. Um, there is a range you can use it. You can be as short as 26 days or as long as 42 days um, in maintenance. Keep in mind that your steady state of buprenorphine with uh, sublocate is not reached until probably about five injections uh, of uh, buprenorphine. So that would be two 300 milligram injections followed by three 100 milligram injections. And, and by then the patient's at steady state. And at that time, um, you can lengthen the uh, dosing interval uh, as, 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 as it suits. The other product we have available in Canada is probuthene, which is the implantable um, buprenorphine rods, um, which delivers 320, which you implant 320 milligrams of rods, A4, um, 80 milligram rods in the upper arm. And this, this provides uh, slow release of buprenorphine over six months. Um, so this is a real patient uh, with real dates of the uh, buprenorphine microdose uh, conversion uh, to methadone. Um, we did it a little slower back then, as you can see. On day one, it was 0.5 milligrams once a day. Methadone stayed the same. Um, day two, 0.5 BID. Methadone was the same. One BID, two BID. And we started decreasing the, uh, the methadone after uh, the four milligram uh, dose was reached. So at three milligrams BID on June the 12th, uh, methadone started going down by 10 milligrams a day. Um, I just uh, chose to go down uh, to, the, to an even number. So 26 to 20, the 10 and then stopped. Stabilized this patient. This patient stabilized at eight milligrams of uh, buprenorphine. I waited three weeks for the methadone to go away and then implanted the uh, probuthene rods. Um, I don't think you have this product available in Australia, but it's, it's kind of handy for the low dose uh, uh, buprenorphine patients eight, on eight milligrams or less. Uh, as you know, sublocated can only be used in patients who are eight milligrams or higher, between eight and, and 24 milligrams. We have a big problem with uh, street fentanyl in, in Canada. Um, we don't see a lot of heroin. I know you see more heroin usage in Australia. Um, so these patients um, seldom present in, uh, in withdrawal. They're using fentanyl and they want to stop using fentanyl. I say that, and then yesterday I had two patients in uh, um, significant withdrawal using street fentanyl. And interesting, you know, and you would normally be doing a microdose induction in someone who's in no withdrawal, but this, these patients were in significant withdrawal. So yesterday my two uh, fentanyl um, fentanyl uh, starts, uh, fentanyl uh, patients uh, were done with a, a standard induction. And so we would do it the same way um, if, if the patient was in a lot of withdrawal. So we would give two milligrams of uh, buprenorphine and then we were giving it uh, every hour. And there's a few cases, this happened about six months ago, started to happen about six months ago. We saw precipitate withdrawal with the second dose of uh, buprenorphine. And that was uh, unexpected because the patient was in so much withdrawal. And we postulated that that was due to uh, high potency uh, fentanyl analogs with uh, a long duration of action. And so what we did was that uh, if we did see precipitated withdrawal after the second dose of buprenorphine two milligrams in the standard induction, we would just microdose up from there. Um, either from two milligrams if we thought it was a big risk or, or after we caused precipitated withdrawal, um, which, was, uh, which would only last for about an hour or so. We would just microdose up from the level we, we attained. Um, so the street fentanyl user uh, which pres who presents in no withdrawal, we started with uh, microdosing induction up to four milligrams, um, suggested that they not use street fentanyl, but and Maybe you could substitute with another opiate uh, or, or you could prescribe another opiate. 
Um, we would see these patients back at uh, buprenorphine four milligrams on the side. Are we gonna continue with uh, microdosing to eight milligrams or switch to a standard induction at that time? So it's a bit of a hybrid model, hybrid induction strategy that requires um, a little bit of judgment. And so that's what uh, we'll term the, term the hybrid induction. And so the patient is using street fentanyl in a little bit of withdrawal. We started with buprenorphine two milligrams. We try a second dose of buprenorphine two milligrams if there's some improvement. If there's any precipitate withdrawal, we'll just finish, the, finish with a microdose from that point. And, uh, and continue up to uh, buprenorphine 12 milligrams. Um, over the years, uh, we've got we've received patients who uh, are on fentanyl patches from uh, primary care physicians, and patients can get up to large doses of fentanyl patches. The largest one we converted was a patient who was using four 100 microgram per hour patches, um, and that was a difficult conversion. Converted that person to 60 milligrams of buprenorphine. So option one, um, you can ask the patient to stop the fentanyl patch uh, 48 hours, and you can cover with short acting uh, opiate equivalents. And the midnight before induction day, you ask the patient to stop the uh, short acting, and then you proceed with the standard induction in the morning. Your typical two milligrams um, Q1H uh, to 12 milligrams uh, or until comfortable. Option two, um, since we started microdosing, we would microdose the patients up to buprenorphine four milligrams, and then we're able to start reducing the fentanyl patch daily. And we were reducing by one uh, 25 microgram per hour patch daily at that point in time. And so you continue your microdose up. Um, sometimes in these patients, they're a little hesitant to do the BID. So then I just do the once a day microdose schedule going up. Um, and decrease the fentanyl patch uh, um, daily. Once you reach, uh, just like everything else, once you reach buprenorphine 12 milligrams, you can stop all the remaining fentanyl patches and then you can just titrate your buprenorphine up as necessary. These patients may not be the most uh, comfortable during this, but uh, it is tolerable. And as long as you educate the patient on that, you can usually uh, do the conversion. Keep in mind that it's difficult to do a conversion on a patient who doesn't wanna be converted. So keep that in mind. So here's, uh, here's a case example of how uh, this was the last conversion we did. This is on the BID schedule. Um, as you can see, day four, we started decreasing the patches um, by 25 uh, per day, continuing if you microdose up to 12 milligrams at that time, same, you can just stop the fentanyl patches and then titrate up and then once they're com comfortable, uh, then that's your daily dose, and then you can follow them up in a week. Here's a nuance. Um, we have a product available in Canada called the Butrans patch, which is a very tiny amount of um, buprenorphine that's released 20 micrograms per hour patch, which is kind of like the first step of the uh, microdose uh, schedule. And so instead of going 0.5 milligrams BID with Suboxone, on day one, you tell the patient to put on a Butrans patch. Day two, when you want a higher dose of uh, Suboxone, you add a second 20 microgram patch. From that point on, then you're dealing with whole pills or half pills and not these tiny uh, quarters. Um, and on day, on um, like the 0.5 milligram dose, then you can just go leave the patches on for a week. They're good for seven days. And then you just go up with uh, the Suboxone pills up till 12 milligrams, and then you can stop all your opiates. You can peel off all the patches because they're done by then, they're seven days. Stop all the other opiates, and then you can titrate your buprenorphine dose up as necessary. So this is what we've been doing for the past uh, two or three months or so, and this was uh, largely COVID-driven. Um, the patient's using opiates, not in withdrawal, we teach the patient uh, how much withdrawal you need to be before you take your first dose of buprenorphine, warn them that they're gonna get really sick if they don't wait until then. Um, we give the patient six tablets of buprenorphine 
and just start when they're in lots of withdrawal and then do their own induction at home and we see them in the ram clinic the next day so we tell the patients to do this on a day uh, the day before the clinic is uh, on a day that the clinic is open and we've had uh, some success with this um, probably about 50 percent of the patients actually never make it back to clinic um, but we get about a 50 percent uptake um, with these home inductions and Sometimes the patients who didn't come back that first time come back a future time to try it again, and then they, they're more dedicated to uh, making it back in the clinic. So those are the uh, seven scenarios that uh, I wanted to cover with, uh, with this talk and uh, open to uh, taking questions at this time. Great, thanks very much, Ken. That was really clear and um, sounds like it's very straightforward. A couple of questions have come through already. Um, any ceiling dose to methadone uh, where you want to use microdosing? So do you set a, an upper limit before you'd accept a patient uh, for a methadone transfer to buprenorphine? I don't have an upper limit myself. Um, I would try it. Um, I would try it. The, the largest uh, methadone dose that I've converted by microdose uh, induction, microdose conversion is 110 milligrams of methadone. Um, if I had a patient who was on a higher dose, I would give it some consideration, but my personal experience is 110 milligrams. I have heard of a couple other doctors um, in Toronto who have converted patients from 150 methadone to uh, Suboxone, um, but they did it successfully. I don't know what it was like, um, but I would give it a try. So I'm looking for higher dose patients, but I've never had the opportunity to try it beyond 110. So it works from 110 in my experience. So Go for that. <laughs> and you mentioned the fentanyl patients in particular might have a bit of discomfort. Um, can you kind of quantify that? Do you get uh, daily withdrawal scores or anything? Do they have a rough patch? Uh, I, I understand when people get to between four and eight milligrams of buprenorphine, it gets a bit rough for a couple of days. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. That's, that's probably the most difficult time is uh, between four and maybe four and 10 milligrams of uh, Suboxone. Um, we don't prescribe uh, additional opiates uh, for people uh, when they go through that. We, we tell people to use ibuprofen and uh, acetaminophen, paracetamol um, for that. And lots and lots of education. Remind people that they have been in worse withdrawal on their very own. And if they can get through this, um, they will come out the other side of winter. Um, so that's how we've been uh, dealing with it. Uh, you can slow down your induction a little bit um, if you're having problems between four and eight milligrams. So instead of going BID, switching to once a day, um, we have not uh, had too much of a problem with that. There are some patients that um, will not take it twice a day because they're so scared to decrease their opiates. So we just go with the uh, once a day dose increases uh, on the micro induction for those people. So we've got through it without using additional supplementary opiates. Good. Um, you, you mentioned the, the use of the Butrans or Norspan as we call it in Australia. Um, so one of my colleagues was thinking about using it in a methadone patient. What would your reaction to that be as the start of the micro dosing? I think that would be a great strategy. Um, I, I think that would work. <laughs> Good, okay, that's very interesting. Um, so another question from uh, Western Australia, we're covering the whole country this evening. Do clients receive their bup doses to take home and do you see misuse, loss or diverted tablets? You said about 50% of your home inductions kind of came back the next day, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> We initially, when we started microdosing, we had we asked the patient. We were very we were very um, hesitant and a little bit apprehensive about how it was going to turn out, right? So those patients, we at the beginning when we were doing this, we were asking patients to go to the pharmacy every day to do an observed dose. Um, and the pharmacist initially, the pharmacist thought I was insane prescribing these crazy tiny doses of Suboxone. So there was a lot of explaining to do too. So watch out in Australia when you start doing this. Um, 
And that it depends on how well you know a patient. Uh, um, I have sent patients with a full blister pack of a week of uh, suboxone microdoses, um, BID, um, blister packed and cut pills cut by the pharmacist. Other patients who I don't know so well, I ask them to go to the pharmacy for the first dose and the second dose they take on their own at home. Um, the beauty of the uh, microdose induction is if they, they mess up a little bit with these tiny doses, they're, they're not gonna cause themselves a whole lot of withdrawal unless they took all of the week's pills all at once and, and caused themselves a good precipitated withdrawal. So that's on them if they do that, that's uh, not my fault. Um, um, yes, uh, buprenorphine suboxone does get diverted, sells for about 20 Canadian dollars per pill, uh, an eight milligram pill. Um, I'm not so fussed about diverted suboxone doses as I am very fussed about diverted methadone doses. Yes. So just following up on your point there about precipitated withdrawal, uh, do you have a specific um, approach if someone develops precipitated withdrawal? Do you hammer on more quickly or stick with your regime? I uh, stick with my regime. So there's these doctors in California who are hammering people with large doses of, uh, of Suboxone when they're in withdrawal. So they were giving um, eight milligrams um, of Suboxone for someone in withdrawal. And if they went into precipitate withdrawal, they hammer them with a second dose of eight milligrams and they wait long enough <laughs> until it all goes away. Um, I prefer not to do it that way. <laughs> yes, I can understand. You've got a clear routine, so um, and that's what works. So we've had thanks for, from a panelist, from a contributor. Thanks very much. Um, you're using buprenorphine naloxone tablets, aren't you, in Canada, rather yeah. than the film which we have here in Australia? Yeah, um, film is coming in I think January or February 2021 in Canada. And um, I think what I would do if I had film, I would start cutting little pieces of film off to create my own microdose. Now, I did talk to Indivier about that, and they said, no, 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 that's, that's not allowed. No, let me guess. They said no. They said no. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, does it? Um, if no, you think it doesn't about make the any manufacturing sense. process, they're obviously spraying the product over the medium, which is the... The, the film and uh, so I think it's very unlikely that there's differing concentrations in different parts of the two. I would, think so. I would think so. So so there you can envision a strategy. You order an eight milligram film, get a ruler and start cutting millimeter lengths and say, you know, and say day one, you're taking one millimeter and then day two, you're taking two millimeters and do your own microdose with one single strip. Yes, absolutely. I, th I think that just makes sense. And we do a bit with the butran. So we trim that off gradually to produce a smoother final withdrawal. Anyway, that's probably another story. Yeah. Um, so another question, do you have patients also using benzodiazepines? That's a significant issue in, in, in our um, part of the world. Uh, also with pregabalin, those two seem to be uh, growing yep. in frequency. We have the same problem in Canada with benzos and pregabalin and, and gabapentin. And so people are crushing and snorting gabbies, as they call them in Canada, um, to get some euphoric uh, kind of dissociative state. Um, so people do that. So you got to be careful of those. Um, with the benzos, uh, there are lots of people that use benzos and use opiates together. And in Canada, right now, the last uh, drug testing street drug testing that I saw out of Toronto showed that 80% of the street fentanyl is contaminated with a benzo, etizolam. Etizolam, yes, we've seen that in Australia too. So, so what happens um, in those overdoses is, is that the paramedics are giving 5, 10, 15 doses of naloxone spray and nothing's happening. Well, it's not reversing the etizolam. <laughs> so that's the problem. So do um, they carry trimazonil yet? <laughs> Um, they carry them in the ER, but not in the, the paramedics don't carry them, not in Canada. Um, yeah, so my, my approach to someone who's using benzos and opiates is that I will, depending on their state, as long as they're stable in, the, in your clinic, I will still proceed with an induction on those patients because I think I can help them with the, uh, with the opiate side of things. Um, it is very hard to estimate how many benzos people are taking. Um, so benzo tapers are a little bit tricky but i don't have any concern using suboxone with uh, benzos 
and hopefully it's a safer combination than they've been using before. Absolutely. Them. Absolutely. Yeah. It's much safer than what they were doing. Yes. Um, so we've had a question about the chronic pain uh, patients. You know, there's growing interest in the long acting injections for a buprenorphine for chronic pain. Have you, do you have any of those in your practice and would you be willing to transfer them from say slow release morphine across to buprenorphine with the long acting injection in mind? We have a number of patients who are chronic pain patients who are referred to us from primary care on massive doses of uh, massive doses of whatever opiate they're taking. Some, you know, morphine equivalents of four or five, six, 800,000 milligrams a day of morphine equivalents. We've converted those people to uh, Suboxone. And some of those patients we've converted to uh, Sublocate as well. Very interesting about the chronic pain patient. Very interesting. Even though you can stabilize them on Suboxone 12, 24 milligrams a day, which is where we essentially maxes it out. You convert them to sublocade, um, give them the loading doses, um, and you know the blood levels are way higher than you can achieve than with oral transmucosal suboxone, right? Yep. Half of those patients um, that we've converted to complain that their pain control is worse on sublocade than on suboxone, so we switch them back. I just don't understand that, but the chronic pain patient is a different animal in Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, so 50% of them that we've converted from Suboxone to Sublocate do well and 50% don't. And so we drop them to a lower dose of buprenorphine and they do better. Bizarre. <laughs> well, that's, that, that needs some working out, doesn't it? Yes. Now, another question. Have you had experience with rapid microinduction, i.e. half a milligram three hourly for the first day and then yeah. one milligram three hourly on day two? Yeah, I've not done that. Um, there are doctors in Toronto and in Calgary who are doing that. It, they're doing it in hospitalized patients, yeah. for example, in the ICU or in a medicine floor, um, and they will do that because they have 24-hour staffing to do that. So um, I have not done that myself. Yeah. So a question, do you think using uh, buprenorphine solo instead of buprenorphine naloxone uh, would be better in, in the conversion process? Um, I don't know. I don't think it makes too much of a difference. Uh, we don't have the solo product in Canada. We used to be able to get it for uh, pregnant women when, you know, in the day they, in the days where they told us we had to switch them, but we can't get it anymore. So it's not really an option for us in Canada, but naloxone is absorbed a little bit um, in your system, even transmucosally. Um, I think 10% of it is absorbed. So I don't think it's going to make an appreciable difference in these tiny, tiny doses that we're using in microdosing. Okay, I, I tend to agree with you, and we certainly try and treat the two the same. Although, you know, about 20% of buprenorphine patients, maybe more in Australia, are on the solo product, which perhaps isn't uh, ideal. Um, another question Do you use the cows in your routine um, monitoring of microdosing, and is it helpful? So that's we use the opioid withdrawal score, isn't it? Yeah, we use the cows in clinic to establish their baseline. We use it during our um, standard inductions. We teach patients the cows on their home inductions, which is, I guess, not the cows, but the sows, yeah. self-administered opioid withdrawal scale. It's essentially the same thing. Um, but uh, we, don't, we don't do it on a daily basis with patients doing their home inductions or their own microdosing at all. Yes. Have not found it need have not found the need to monitor that closely. Yes. The BD dosing question, um, we, we've got Subutex still, so buprenorphine solo 0.4 milligrams. So the question is, could we play around with that as a, a once yeah. daily by going 14.8, et cetera? Yeah, well, actually that's probably what we're doing here, right? So when we try taking a two milligram pill and cutting it into quarters, Yes. Am I really getting 0.5 or am I getting 0.4 one day and 0.6 the next, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. it'll be fine. Or a That'd bit of great but, Yes, yes. Okay. Um, what about someone who carries on using their primary opioid after you've got them onto 12 or 16 milligrams of Suboxone? Any hints or clues, suggestions there? Well, here's, here's the, uh, the trick about that. Um, if patients are taking 16 milligrams of Suboxone properly, um, I have uh, learned from experience that the effect of their exogenous opiate is essentially blocked out. And so they can 
keep using if they want to spend their money on heroin or fentanyl. Um, if I have them on 16, which I am very reassured that their levels are good when they're on sublocate, um, then that's fine. We, we counsel them. You say, well, you know, you're really wasting your time. You're putting yourself at risk. Um, eventually people learn, but some people take longer to learn that lesson than others. <laughs> some people with more money, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so a question, are there any comorbidities that would preclude you from using microdosing in a patient? Uh, comorbidities, um, severe liver failure, perhaps you'd consider if their enzymes are really out of whack. Um, no, we've used it in um, patients over 65, uh, chronic pain patients, uh, COPD, diabetics. I, I can't think of a specific kind of contraindication it's I think it's safer than the opiates that they are using exactly exactly that's how I would frame it I think um, a question whether you're using lefexidine in Canada to support uh, some of those withdrawal symptoms on those difficult days five or four and five and six well that's an interesting question to ask so I'll ask you a question back what is lefexidine <laughs> oh, okay so it's an alpha one agonist I think oh. uh, maybe so it's a clonidine clone, but it's said to okay. be better in some way that I don't fully yeah. understand. Yeah. Um, yeah, we use sometimes use clonidine if we need to. Clonidine, ibuprofen, um, paracetamol, acetamin. Yeah, I've done that. Good. Yeah. Um, have you had any patients with intractable nausea and vomiting with buprenorphine induction? Uh, we did have one patient like that. And we had to, uh, no matter what you did, with this one patient and there was only one patient out of a thousand maybe um, that we've seen that so not often i think i can think of one too and it's unusual and i think you've just got to choose something else haven't you we actually got around um, it by giving a question from Simon. <laughs> can you just explain that for us <laughs> those who can't understand why that should work <laughs> A question from Simon Holliday. Um, have you had experience using the depot in pregnancy? I have not used uh, depot in pregnancy. Um, I have not started depot in someone in pregnancy. Um, if someone got pregnant while they're on depot, um, you know, we tell people to use birth control or give them the depot per vera shot and et cetera, et cetera. People, someday someone will get pregnant. Um, at that point in time, we'll have a discussion and say, well, you know, um, you're probably going to be okay on the depot. It's um, if I read the instructions and the monograph, it says you you can't. But um, I think the risk of uh, relapse and withdrawal is bigger if you stop the depot when you try to make the conversion uh, back to oral. So I wouldn't convert them back, um, but I let them choose. Um, I just saw a study of uh, in the U.S. Uh, three case reports um, of patients exposed to uh, depot supplicate. And there were no problems. <laughs> it's going to be a bit like the Suboxone story, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be the same. When you've got enough babies born to Suboxone mothers and it's fine, then... Yeah, that, our, that'll be the story, I think. Our apprehensions will be addressed. Um, th there was a question about, do you feel there's any difference in the pain patients uh, manage with the standard supplicate induction 300, 300, 100, and those who stay on the 300. Do you, I mean, we, we see the, the plasma levels are significantly higher in those 300 milligrams. Very different. They're twice as high. <laughs> yes. Uh, so wouldn't that be twice as good for their pain? Absolutely, because the more the better, right? That, that's, yes. that's, that's, that's uh, addictions. Um, so the pain patients... Um, most of the pain patients, uh, the ones that stay on, end up on the 300 milligram maintenance dose. I always try dropping to the 100, um, but almost uh, like 80% of them will stay on it, will have to go back to the 300. That's my experience. That's, that is an interesting insight, and I think we would probably share it uh, as well. Although I have one lady recently who decided it, it had made no difference, so she, she stopped. And I've been ringing her each month saying, do you want to reconsider? And she says, no, things really aren't any different. So I'll stay off it. Thank you. She denied getting withdrawals. Even. So they can be a strange lot, can't they? Yeah, chronic pain is very, very difficult to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Um, do you get a lecture from the pharmacist about splitting the tablets? Oh yeah, um, yep, yeah, yep. Do. There's a there's a I've had run-ins with pharmacists where they say, "I am not allowed to split these tablets, and I will not split these tablets." So I just tell the patient, "You can either switch pharmacies or buy a tablet splitter." <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm just seeing if there are any other questions. Yes, while some would be alarmed at giving six two milligram take home doses to a new patient, you know, I, I think we've just got to get over this methadone mindset, don't you? Yeah, I think so. And and these days with COVID, um, I think you have to take uh, you know more precaution, more precautions. Um, you know, weigh the risk of getting COVID versus the risk of treating the patient properly. So right now in my hospital. Um, there's a COVID outbreak of, I think, 50 or 60 people, half patients and half staff, and they've closed, they just announced the hospitals closed the new admissions, closed elective surgeries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So tomorrow's my surgery day, which is not going to happen. <laughs> wow. Um, well, I must say that Australia is very different in that regard, because I think most states, have, apart from people in quarantine, have gone more than a month before since a community acquired infection. So we're very yeah. lucky in that regard. I guess being as close as you are to uh, the US of A, uh, it would be hard to avoid uh, things coming across the border. The border is closed, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. We're going to build we're going to build the wall. <laughs> That's a really effective response. Good to hear. <laughs> Um, another question, is there much Suboxone injecting in Canada, do you think? Um, I don't think so. Um, in Canada, people if abusing Suboxone, they crush it and snort it. Mm. Um, I have had patients tell me that, that it's happening, um, injection. Um, so mostly, predominantly, abuses by uh, snorting in Canada. Mm. Uh, and I've got another question here. Do you always wait the full 28 days after the first 300 milligrams of supplicade? Um, I usually, I, I will. I, I think I've always waited 28 days. Um, you can make it 26 days if you want. So if you look at the plasma level graph of um, the first 300 milligram dose, the last two weeks it drops below two nanograms, two nanograms per ml, right? And that's if patients are going to feel any withdrawals, it's, the last two weeks of the first injection. So I could make the point that you could give that second loading dose early, um, but I've not tried that yet. Have you tried that yet? <laughs> well, I believe the colleague in Melbourne who asked that question uh, may sometimes give two 300s on the, the first dosing occasion, as it were, so 600 milligrams to begin. Oh, that will drive your uh, C-max up really high that first uh, <laughs> few days. It's such a safe medication, though. It's um, I think there's yeah. a lot of um, room for error with, with buprenorphine. Well, a few patients describe getting very high um, um, that first, sometimes 24, sometimes 48 hours after that first dose of supplicate. And they describe it as a very enjoyable high. <laughs> and they hope for it the second shot, but I tell you might not <laughs> the second time. <laughs> Although, interestingly, the, the peak trough ratios for Buvidal are much larger than they are for supplicate. The ratio for supplicate is only about two, whereas for Bouvidal, it's more like four or five. So oh, I you would, might get buzzed. <laughs> well, we have a Bouvidal buzz, and this is just gospel. Who had been on the supplicate at Bouvidal and preferred the Bouvidal because of that initial buzz. And as, oh, I think we're just well, when we get when we get Buvidal as you know, in Canada, <laughs> when we get Buvidal in Canada, I'll let you know if we get the buzz here in Canada too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got another message of thanks, Dr. Lee, an amazing lecture, so clear and so extremely helpful. Um, Thank you very much. So uh, oh, here we go. So we recently moved from Suboxone to buprenorphine naloxone generic. And some patients we've tried to convert from morphine to suboxone have had respiratory depression on day three. Really? Um, older patients. Um, we have uh, generic. We have generic here in Canada too. Um, so we had brand name for a while, for the, the for a while, and then generics came in, and we had three generics come in, 
two of them had to be taken off the market because they were not bioequivalent. <laughs> so right, that's a bit scary. It is, yeah. <laughs> so are you faithful to the brand then these days? Well, um, the government uh, scheme doesn't always cover the brand, right? So uh, the reimbursement. The reimbursement plan. So um, patients can choose to pay for the brand or pay the difference or they can get the generic. Yes. Okay. So what the problem with the, the generics, was that too much or too little buprenorphine? Oh, it's always too little. <laughs> It's never too much. <laughs> so that doesn't explain why they would be getting respiratory depression on day three. I don't know what the reason. No, that, for that. that uh, I don't under, I don't, I can't explain that. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, so anyone else wish to pose a question? We've got about five minutes remaining. Uh, another warm thank you, Dr. Lee. We hope to see your protocol soon. So you did indeed send them through to me. So um, I will make sure they go to the Insight website so they can be uh, accessed that way if anyone yeah. would. Yeah, feel free to share. You know, the best part of all this was going to Bern, Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Where they don't really use buprenorphine. I mean, what, what a paradox is that? Isn't that crazy? I, I showed I showed Dr. Hemig our data and he said, well, Ken, um, you do way more of this than me. Um, you tell me what to do. I said, oh, OK. <laughs> He's a nice guy. He's a uh, drummer. He's a rock band drummer. <laughs> so did you have a bit of a jam together? Well, he uh, invited us out for drinks, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, I, 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 I'm amazed at how well you, you presented and packed all that information in. Uh, as everyone has heard, there's a recording which will be available. Ah, oh, there's one more question. What about naloxone? You mentioned the nasal uh, product, which has come to Australia. Unfortunately, it's made by Monday, which upsets me a little bit, but we'll move on. Do you talk to your patients about naloxone when you're microdosing? Um, all the patients that come to a RAM clinic are offered a, a naloxone kit. And uh, they're provided free by the Canadian um, uh, pharma plan. And so right. everybody, not, interesting, not everyone takes one. <laughs> and it's and that the, the no, it's not necessary for you. It's, it's good before your friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the final word is that please, will you fill out the evaluation, anyone online to... Um, so we can express our warm thanks to Dr. Lee again and tell him how really good his talk was. Um, so there's a survey coming up on the chat um, through the Insight uh, website. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I thought it was an excellent talk, well worth waiting for. Sorry for people who've had to stay up late at night. Sorry for you getting up so early in the morning. Really appreciate it and hope we can catch up in the flesh one day. Oh, absolutely. You know, my, my preference would be to come to Australia and do this in person. We're COVID free. You just have to spend a couple of weeks in a hotel at your own cost in quarantine, but then you'd be free to travel. Oh, that's no problem because I was planning to stay for three months. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I really appreciate your help and thank you very much. Take care, Jeremy. Cheers. Bye, everybody. Bye, thank you.